mes collègues du groupe numéro 1. They lowered the, uh, this podium for me this morning. <laughs> it's like, I can't see over. And I, I was thinking it's, it's easier to talk, of course, if, if I could see you. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this national summit. Uh, I'm really quite honored. It was Philip this morning from Guysboro who told me that this is likely the first time in the country that a summit like this has ever been organized with this mix of people. So this is just absolutely fabulous. It was in 2004 that I wrote a paper called Culture and Recreation, Links to Wellbeing. And I wrote that paper because I was so fascinated by the work that you were all doing. And I wanted to be able to capture it and to share it with some of my colleagues who typically don't read the work or not involved in your field. And my hope for this conference, can I still answer that question? That was the question from the other day. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit behind here. <laughs> my hope for this conference is that your work, both individually and collectively, will be recognized well beyond this summit in other fields and that your work will help shape some of the important policy conversations that are underway in the country. So I've been asked today to talk about building healthy communities and I suppose I should really talk about building on healthy communities because there's a lot of good work underway in the country. What I'd like to do is just briefly touch on some of the relevant literature present you a framework on healthy communities that I have been developing as part of our work at Caledon Institute. And then I'd like to talk about some of the policy uh, remedies and policy actions that I think that we should be taking together and that I would hope would come out of this summit. So let me just start with some of the literature. You know, I was thinking about, if we're so polite in Canada, we use only the H word. <laughs> Actually, we use the H words. We, we talk about hockey and about health. And even though this is the recreation summit, I won't be talking about hockey, I promise you. I'll be talking about health, because I do think that there are intrinsic links, and this came out so clearly in the presentations yesterday, very eloquently, on the links between recreation and health. And in Canada, we've been leaders in many areas in this field. We have our national our public health care system. And, and for the most part, it works well, and we're proud, I think, as Canadians of that system. But there's also a lot that has to be repaired, and we'll be hearing more about that as we move toward 2014. That's the date at which those fiscal arrangements that support our healthcare system expire, and there will be conversations in the country underway leading up to those transfers. I think there's a big policy opportunity here for everybody in this room, but I'll get back to that in a minute. Canada's played a major role as well in terms of health promotion. We had the new perspectives on the health of Canadians in 1974, and the international charter that was signed, the Ottawa Charter on Health Promotion, due to have its 25th anniversary soon. We've played a major role in the World Health Organization's social determinants of health. Trevor spoke about this yesterday. It's so uh, important, a body of work relating poverty and social networks and affordable housing and social relationships to our health. But I think that Canada actually has really made a mark in terms of healthy communities. And we do have to thank Trevor Hancock for that work, for really putting that concept and that practice, I think, on the map, both in Canada and elsewhere in the world. So thank you, you're the father of this movement. You call yourself the grandfather of the movement, but you know, it, it, is, it is truly important. What I think is really critical from our perspective is the fact that there's more and more talk from many different sources about healthy communities. And what's interesting is that recreation figures prominently in those conversations, either directly, implicitly, or directly. And, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity to see ourselves in other agendas. And I'll just touch upon a few of these areas. So we heard yesterday about community design, for example. And what we're finding from the literature on community design is that the way in which we build our communities, physically, but also socially, has a really significant impact upon our health. So there's a whole world of architecture and of, of planners with whom we should be speaking and working because we know that walkability and, and uh, trails and places to be together, green spaces, are absolutely critical to our health. We know from an international body of literature on social capital the importance of healthy communities. 
use because social capital refers to relationships, associations, and networks. And we make these relationships in communities. And even though we may have many, many electronic networks, I don't think that our face-to-face, -face, our real-life FaceTime, will ever replace those electronic networks. It's in our communities that we build those relationships that are so fundamental to our health. And it's through recreation and play, and I use the term recreation very broadly, very widely, as did the other speakers. It's through recreation that we make those links. There's another body of literature in the world and practice that I think is very significant related to poverty reduction. And it's on poverty and social exclusion. And you see this mainly in Europe, where the two terms are linked, so that they deal with poverty not just through income security programs and employment training, but they look at exclusion, the concept of inclusion. How are you a part of your community? How do you count in your world? And healthy communities and social exclusion uh, are, are addressed. Uh, social inclusion is actually promoted through the kind of work in which you're involved. Another whole opportunity. There are several poverty reduction strategies underway in the country. There's only a few jurisdictions that actually have explicitly spoken about exclusion. Poverty and exclusion is Quebec, and I believe Newfoundland has as well. And Michelle and Nunavut are talking about uh, poverty reduction in your territory and looking at the notion of inclusion. There's a big opportunity there for your work in that conversation. And finally, there's actually a very unusual bedfellow, strange literature for us to be looking at, I think, but it comes from the work on competitiveness and prosperity. And it's talking about the fact that in a knowledge-based economy, that cities and economic regions have to attract talent. And if that's one of the main challenges that they face, if they're going to attract talent, they have to offer not only good jobs with the associated pay and you know, benefits, they have to look at their quality of life because that's what people are looking for. They're looking for clean air and places to be with their families, to walk livable, walking communities. They're looking for good schools, affordable housing, and community amenities, like culture, for example. It was interesting because a, a number of years ago, Forbes magazine had done a, an article on the best 10 top cities in the world to do business, and they included Toronto in there. Was surprising. Um, and one of the reasons was that they had so many cultural uh, seats in their seats. And so culture and recreation, those are being seen as major attractions. So from all these perspectives, and I've named only a few, community design, economic prosperity, poverty and social exclusion, social capital development, your agenda is in all those areas. But even if, they, even if you didn't figure prominently in those areas, what I find really powerful is the evidence base that you yourself have gathered from your work. And I'm speaking, of course, about you know, the, the benefits book, or volume of material that was developed. And every single day, there's more material coming on stream. I mean, as I said, I did that report in 2004, and there's probably triple the evidence available uh, in terms of the value of your work. And what I think we really have to do is find a way to capture that information. It needs to go beyond this room. The benefits that we've talked about in terms of physical health, mental health, and emotional well-being. And I know Jane, you said we need to do more work on the emotional part. Absolutely. But there is some really good evidence. Uh, and the, ch the children at risk, and we have a big crime agenda in the country. We really need that information that you're developing on children at risk. The way in which we develop links in communities and associations, that social embeddedness that's developed through participation in recreation is so critical because what we see now is that those young people who participate in activities in their youth actually become the leaders later on. They become the, you know, the volunteers and contribute measurably to communities. And then there's some really, uh, I guess, um, very unexpected literature, at least from my perspective, and Mark made reference to it yesterday, but it was the, uh, the economic components, uh, more specifically, the work on social assistance recipients. And this was the study that came out of McMaster University looking at 
social assistance or welfare recipients. And there were 765 families involved in this study, about 1,300 young people, children. And they, they looked at five major interventions for these families. They put them actually, they divided families into five groups on the basis of different interventions. There was counseling, there was employment training, there was money, the things that we typically do with welfare reform. You know. uh, there was supervised recreation, and there was nothing. And it turns out that the families who had their children involved in supervised recreation were the ones that did the best. Because the parents said they had some relief, they had some respite, they were able to do some of the things that they needed to do, either training or recreation or education, or even just take a break. And that, to me, was completely unexpected because, it, as I was saying, in the field in which I'm working, we just, we, we never make those links. Recreation doesn't figure prominently in the field, and it should. I think all of this to say that recreation is both an end and a means, and it's really important, I think, in our policy discussions and from a strategy perspective to look at it in that way. It's an end in itself because it is so important in terms of the kinds of outcomes that we see and the power of recreation across the board, physically, mentally, socially, and even financially. But it's also a means to achieving other important ends. And, and that's where I think these other bodies of literature are. And I'll talk about that later in terms of the policy agendas that I think that we can influence. So let me just move into so the discussion of the um, framework on healthy communities that, uh, that I have been working on. And I'll present to you some pictures in a minute in case you thought I had forgotten that there was uh, a PowerPoint that caught up in, in just our, our conversation. Um, you know, at Caledon, we do primarily public policy work. We work on taxation and employment insurance and income security reform. But there's another important aspect of the work in which we're involved, and that's with communities. And we've been involved for the past 10 years in a national project called Vibrant Communities, in which 14 communities across the country are joined together in a learning partnership to find local solutions to reduce poverty. So Liz Weaver works on that, and Mark, who's uh, somewhere here, uh, works on Mark Bosch, who spoke yesterday, works on that as well. And our role at Caledon was to do the writing and the policy work and some of the, um, the learning, coordinating some of the learning related to that fantastic community work. And we were struggling with this concept, what is a vibrant community? And what does it mean? What is a healthy community? And what would it look like? And at the time, I was doing a lot of work on the concept of sustainable development. And this concept of resilience figured prominently in that literature. And I thought, you know, it may be interesting to take a look at that work on resilience and see if there's anything that we can learn from that work and apply to communities. And, you know, it would sort of enlighten us. And I thought it would be fairly straightforward. Well, that was wrong. A very incorrect <laughs> assumption because it's actually quite a complex literature. It's complicated. It's everything confusing. Um, but what I found fascinating about it was that the concept of resilience actually figures prominently in several major bodies of literature, not just one. I found it in the ecology literature, and it was also in the mental health literature. For anybody here who works in the area of mental health or with young children or with families, this concept of resilience comes out very clearly. So that was interesting, because here's two very, very different bodies of work, both of which are based on a, 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 you know, a similar founding concept. So I thought, well, maybe that has some uh, you know, opportunity here for what we can learn about communities. I started to look at that work on ecology. And basically, in a nutshell, it talks about how natural systems survive in the face of challenge and change through um, uh, emergencies or uh, through some kind of shock like a, an earthquake or flood or fire. So how does the forest rehabilitate? How do our oceans you know, heal themselves after the oil shock that we have? And there's a lot of study in the world going on, on you know, looking at natural systems and how they adapt, how they change, and how they come through those kind of shocks. So those two concepts of survival and adaptation 
came out very clearly from that literature. So just park that over here for a minute, because we'll come back to it. We're going to go here to the mental health literature. And trust me, your work figures prominently in this configuration, so I will get there. Um, so you look at the mental health literature, and it's similar, but somewhat different, because it's really talking about individuals, households, small groups, and how they have come through difficult circumstances and dealt with shocks, like, for example, death of a family member, or disability, sudden disability, or um, addiction, or even racism. And typically what you see in this literature is that people who struggle with a real challenge actually say that they come out stronger. They recognize that challenge, they engage with it actively, and they find opportunity in the challenge that they have faced. Their struggle equals strength. So I thought, well, that's interesting, because the themes then of engagement and opportunity were coming out clearly from there. So what I did at that point had these four themes. I went out and started talking to some groups across the country and say, does this make sense to you? I'm hearing about the resilience, you know, I've done some work in resilience. Does this make sense to you? And one of the women I found in, in, in the groups that I had talked to said, you know what? You know, um, in the developed world, we can survive. We survive, unlike in, in many of the developing countries, but many of us can't sustain our families. We have many working poor. We can't continue to feed our children and pay our rent. And so sustenance is a better concept for us rather than survival. So let me show you how I put this together because I think it's a, a framework that we can use for understanding our communities. So here's, I, I'm not sure, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you can actually see it at the back because I realize that this is in black, so let me just read it to you. So you have sustenance and adaptation on the one hand, that's from the ecological literature, and you have engagement and opportunity, and that's from the mental health literature. And together, you get a framework that looks like this. And I want to please say that I'm not in any way presenting this work as the only framework or the only way to think about our work. It's one way. It's a way that was helpful actually for me personally because I was trying to include in our social policy work areas of recreation and culture and other kinds of factors that we typically don't take into account in traditional social policy work. But then I thought, well, let's populate some of these areas and see what we get. And I asked people, what are you doing in each of these areas? So those who were working primarily around survival or sustenance said that they're working on basic needs. And that has to do with decent, affordable housing and income security and anything that has to do really with your basic survival in communities. And there's a lot of people in your communities working on those areas. Next, there were a set of people working around adaptation. And how do we define adaptation? Because this is clearly a, um, I would say, taking poetic license, perhaps, with the concept of resilience, but we're adapting the concept to our work. So what kind of adaptation work are you doing? And so there were a lot of people involved in basic coping skills, things like early childhood development and literacy and settlement services. And it went on. But just to give you an example, there were other people then who were involved in engagement, and those were the individuals working actively in recreation, in cultural expression, in volunteering, and in decision making, engaging citizens in making decisions. And then there were a lot of people, at least in our poverty reduction groups, working on skills development, job creation, and financial show you before discussing the implications that this framework is being used now in a number of cities and here's how the I know it's hard to probably see this in detail but here's how the city of Halton has used this chart and has really fleshed out these areas to understand where they are on the map. Okay so let's go back just to this framework so we can take a look at why this has some meaning what I hope has some meaning for recreation. I like this framework because it says to communities that it's not all about job creation and training. And often when you work in communities and 
they say, well, what, are, what do our priorities have to be? Typically, you will find people saying, well, we need to have an economic development plan. And if we have an economic development plan, everything else falls into place. But we know that's not true. We know that for many people, you know, they may need extra assistance or extra training, or whether it's around language, for example, or childcare services. We know, we've seen now, with our growing poverty and growing inequality, the growing gap between rich and poor, that rising tides do not lift all boats. They lift only yachts. And so the problem is that you can't just focus on opportunity. That's, there's more to the world than this. And I've seen it in so many municipalities. You know, for example, we were invited by the Social Service Department of the City of Hamilton to develop a social vision for the newly amalgamated City of Hamilton. Why? Because the City Council had developed a new economic development plan and said, that's it, you know, we'll have that in place and then people will find jobs and everybody will work and, you know, we'll have a, a warring coming economy and it's all great. Well, it's not. This is a far more holistic understanding of communities and what we need to do in communities. I'll tell you another reason why I think it's important. If you look at the left-hand side, which is sustenance and adaptation, those concepts that derive from the ecology perspective, it talks about the safety net functions of communities. We need to have safety net functions that provide a protection and a capacity for people to feel safe and to live safely. At the same time, we have on the other side, deriving from the mental health components, the springboard opportunities that communities help create. There are two major streams of work that we see in healthy communities, safety net function and springboard functions, and they're both equally important. And the springboard functions are those that help people feel as though they're, they have a role in this world, that they have a role to play, that they're an agent in their own lives. They're incredibly if you look at the top of the framework, the top two, that's talking about the things that we need in communities to be healthy. Jobs and food and all those things, the instrumental things. If you look at the bottom two components, the adaptation and the engagement, here to me this is profound in terms of the message to communities. This is the emotional, this is the mental health, these are the spiritual components of communities that we typically leave out that we say, when we have enough money, we'll do that. And this framework is intended to say, all of these elements are important. They're crucial to a healthy community. And we need to pay attention to them all. We may not be able to do everything all at the same time. We recognize the fact that we need to figure out priorities. But don't forget the fact that all these areas are important. And you can see where recreation figures prominently in this configuration. It's part of engagement, it's a crucial part of engagement, and has a, a, a vital component in terms of healthy communities. One more aspect of this that I think is important, and that is that it talks about functions, functional, uh, I guess, um, imperatives in communities. So it doesn't start by saying, well, what are our services, and how are we going to change our services to, you know, to sort of meet needs, or how are we going to think about government programs and then structure everything along the lines of government programs. It's saying, what do we need to do in our communities to build a healthy community, and how are we going to work within these areas to be able to do that? And your answer in your community can be very different from your answer in your community, and your answer in your community will be different from that one, and that's a good thing. And yesterday we were asked in our small groups to talk about, you know, our partnerships and with whom would we partner, who are the potential partners. And actually, I, don't, I personally couldn't answer it because I think that the, there are hundreds and hundreds of answers to that particular question, depending on where you are and what you're working on. Maybe if you're focusing on a national policy agenda, and I, as I said, I will discuss some of those questions, if you have a big policy agenda, you want to identify your strategic partners. When you're working in communities, you need to be able to have any number of partnerships. That's really an open book. That's an open paint sketchboard, or whatever you want to call it, tablet on which you can palette, I guess, on which you can paint. So, this is a way to think about communities, but it also, I describe in this book that I've written about about this resilience framework, 
is also a way to think about what we do. Because effectively what this says is that all these functions are actually clusters of activity. And cluster theory is based on innovation, the innovation work that's come out of the, you know, the Harvard Business School, talking about thinking more in systems rather than as individual programs and individual agencies like we're typically forced to do, often by, by funders. You know, put in our, in our little corner, here's our little program. This is saying, let's think more systemically so that within each of these areas, there's a whole cluster of organizations, agencies, groups that are doing work in these areas. And if we can think where we can position ourselves within one of these areas, where typically I would think most of you probably are involved in engagement. Think of what you're doing more globally, that there's many, many other organizations working in your area, and not just necessarily in your area in parks and recreation, but in arts and culture. And I was so happy to see Linda and a number of other people here from the arts community. But that that's really starting to think more in terms of cluster. There are opportunities to work with people in strategic ways. So in this framework, we talk a lot about joining up within the clusters. Now joining up doesn't necessarily mean that you have to pull your, into your organizations together uh, administratively. You could do that if you wanted to, but it could mean any number of things depending on your agenda. You can share information, you can do a joint program, you can share evaluation, you might share students, you can have a bigger community planning process. It's you can be as creative as you want, and you'll have many, many different partnerships and, and relationships depending on what it is you're trying to do. But here's where some of the innovation comes in. When you start moving outside of your cluster, when you start looking at what's happening in some of the other areas, and you begin to make links across the board. And that's, again, consistent with innovation theory, which says that some of the real innovations come when you're sort of combining some of the unusual suspects. I'll just give you a few examples because there's a lot of examples in the country and I know that many of you could provide your own examples. But some of the interesting work, for example, within the cluster, and there was Playworks Ontario and some of you have been involved in that, um, which got together a group of organizations in, in uh, recreation, in physical education and arts and culture and started to identify the key areas of literature that were important, started to look for youth-friendly communities and basically had conversations with municipalities all together it was developing a joint curriculum and that was an, and a joint message and that was actually really important. Another area of joining up with him that I found really interesting it was based on a story we have a series of community stories that we write and one of them was about the Dufferin Mall I don't know if some of you know the story of the Dufferin Mall but they were having a really difficult time this was a mall that was in the catchment area of six schools. And there was a lot of, a lot of young people hanging out at the mall, and they were getting into trouble. And the mall had become a fortress. In the words of the mall manager, that mall was a fortress. There were the security cameras, and the guards, and the alarm system. And one day, a murder was committed at the mall. And the mall manager said, you know what? A murder is not so good for business. I have a problem here. And then he had another epiphanous moment, which was, you know what, it's not my problem alone. The fact that there's six schools in the catchment area is their problem. The fact that there's 20 community agencies in this catchment area is also a problem. And for the police, this is a problem. He brought everybody together around a big, long table that he described as a football field. And he said, we have a problem, and we have to figure this out together. And they realized that actually keeping the young people away was not so good for business either. So they started to think of how could they use the mall in a positive way and began to develop a number of recreational and cultural programs to which the kids were attracted. They had baseball teams and soccer teams and, and drama programs at the mall. It became effectively a community hub. And I think it's a terrific example of, sort of joining up their efforts together and using recreation as a means to achieve an end, you know, to, to avoid the juvenile justice system, which effectively was happening. It was the truant officers and the police, and this was a far more constructive way to approach this. It was clearly a win for everybody. 
even governments are starting to look now at joining up and, and requiring communities to actually work together. So Steve in Quebec en France, you were describing in our group yesterday what you're doing in terms of having community agencies work together to develop a plan and funding that plan. And Active Alberta, I think, is doing a similar kind of thing in terms of looking at a coordinated approach. BC Healthy Families is going to be introduced in 2012, again, looking at joining up. Across clusters, some really interesting work that you yourselves have done. The Canadian Recreation and Parks Association had its Everybody Gets to Play initiative. And the problem was, it wasn't just the barriers in terms of access to programs, it was also transportation and the availability of childcare. So one of the programs was in BC on the Sunshine Coast. There were about 38 organizations involved, and they figured out a whole system for ensuring that the community had access to recreation, low cost or free programs, transportation, because you couldn't get there from here, affordable childcare. They put together the system and went across these areas to build a, you know, something that actually worked for people. They built a system around the needs of people. Very, very powerful. There's a uh, Saint Michel in Montreal is one of our arriving communities. I think it was an original, actually, healthy community, Saint Michel en Santé. And they had lost their economic base when the quarries, uh, the quarries had closed. They brought together several hundred citizens, developed a neighborhood revitalization plan with recreation and culture as its weave, its constant weave throughout everything. It's in the DNA of the community. It's the way in which that community has come together and has reshaped itself, has revitalized itself. It's not just a program, although there are programs and recreational venues that they've created, but it's also part of their fiber and their fabric. And what they did, you know, building on that engagement, they also knew that it was the birthplace of um, the founder of Cirque du Soleil. And so they have an international training circus um, uh, venue that's been built there. And they're now joining their recreation and their opportunity, their job skills training, because the job creation, because they have this unique opportunity in that community. They're joining their engagement and their opportunity, those two functions. In London, Ontario, the City of London had brought together several hundred people for a sustainability plan. And they were developing, the residents were developing this plan and realizing that many of their recreational kinds of uh, uh, desires and needs were very similar to the, um, the, the, the plans and the program of the environmental groups. And so they began to work with the environmental groups because they were talking about biking and walking and you know similar kinds of issues related to transportation and walkability. I met some people here from Manitoba who were talking about uh, Healthy Child Manitoba and how great it was. And I thought that was an interesting, are you here? I thought that was an interesting project in, in communities because it's looking at combining adaptation and education. I'm sorry, adaptation and engagement. What the government is saying is we have so many programs that are trying to meet family needs, we have to ensure that they all fit together. Because oftentimes what we do when we set up programs is that they're individual and you have to qualify over and over again for those programs. And sometimes uh, if you qualify for one, you get disqualified from another. And so having a joint system is really important. My last example, this is in uh, in Alberta, the Alberta Obesity Strategy recently announced, and I think that's an interesting culmination of picking pieces from the different areas because it's looking at healthy eating and engagement and bariatric surgery and all the components, and it probably will develop even further as this evolves. But a very interesting example. So we have an infinite number of choices in terms of the partnership. And that's why we say that question to me is open and really depends on the community in which you're working. So all this to say, there's a lot of opportunity for the work that we do. And I'd like to just now talk about very briefly in this last segment about some actions and policy opportunities. I think there's three actions that we should be looking at. The first is repositioning recreation. Second is embedding it in other policy agendas, and the third has to do with removing barriers. I think there's 
many ways of repositioning recreation. We'll be talking about this more tomorrow, so I'm not going to go into it in detail. But I do believe that the framework I've presented is our way, at least in, in you know, the field in which I'm working, of, of repositioning recreation effectively by saying it is a fundamental and core building block of, of our notion of healthy communities. It's part and parcel of everything that we have to do. And in that sense, it's helped reposition, at least in our own work, recreation. And I think there may be some you know, way in which this summit can think about recreation in terms of the work that you're doing. There are many opportunities as well to amend recreation in current policy agendas. And I really encourage you to think about this one. There are a lot of opportunities. I know that we can't do everything. Know that we have to be strategic and think about where you can have the most impact. But let me just talk about two of them the aging society and uh, our public health conversations. Um, we hear so much about the aging society right now. It's, you know, every day in the paper there's something new coming out about Canada's aging society that it's going to be a burden. We're facing a structural deficit, a parliamentary budget officer puts out reports on this all the time and links it to our aging population. We're talking about labor shortages, what our aging population will cost in terms of long-term care, uh, you know, the fact that we have to pay for pensions. This is such a negative talk. It's really, really unfortunate. The International Monetary Fund has come out recently saying that the toll, the toll of aging on G20 is going to be 10 times greater than the most recent recession and Canada is most at risk. And so all the, you know, the conversation that's out there right now in terms of the aging society is the burden. You know, the burden, the fact that we won't have anything for investing in children, and, and it really is a negative message. And then we have the work that you're doing, and the literature that comes out of the work in which you're involved that talks about the potential for slowing the physiological clock and addressing some of the chronic diseases that we face, you know, as we age. Uh, some information that came out, for example, from uh, Lancet Neurology just, just a, a week or two ago, uh, which actually said that about 30% of Alzheimer cases were attributable to inactivity. I was blown away by that. What does that say for the potential of your work? You know, we, we uh, also see the discussion that says that our rising health care costs that are going to consume so much of our budgets are due to the aging of the population. It's not just the aging of the population. The Canada Health and uh, uh, Canadian Info Health Information System has talked about the fact that it's multiple chronic diseases that are uh, causing the increases. And those are linked. And we can do something about that. Trevor spoke yesterday about obesity. Obesity has been found to be linked to 22 chronic diseases responsible for most of type 2 diabetes and heart, cardiovascular disease and cancers. So we have a way of intervening in that. We have a way of keeping people active and healthy. And it's not just physical activity. There's a whole movement on brain fitness into which fit so nicely as well. Please inject yourself in this conversation. We need to turn it around. And if you don't believe the literature, then speak to Perry, who's here from northern Manitoba, who will tell you that his 80-year-old friend became far more healthy once he started doing physical activity than he was when he was 50 or 60. The evidence is overwhelming and powerful. Please be part of this conversation to change it, because we're going on a downward trajectory in this regard. And we have a tremendous amount to offer. And on the health care front in particular, the first ministers are talking about renewing that health care agreement with the federal government. And in preparation for that, they are meeting. The Council of the Federation, which is all the first ministers, met in Vancouver in July. And they issued a um, press release. I have it here. They issued a press release and they've identified four areas of priority. And one of them is emphasizing healthy living which will improve the quality of life. And they're going to be meeting again in Nova Scotia in 2012. And they've instructed their staff, apparently, according to this memo, uh, to be working in these areas. Has anybody contacted you? Please get your work and your agenda on here, because you can make a fantastic difference 
in terms of our healthcare system and health more generally. And my recommendation is to not to wait to say uh, government should do this or we recommend that the officials do that. Do it. Write that framework. For example, you have 99 pages showing that you know how to write a framework in this sector. And what I would do is write a framework that can be delivered right to the health ministers that will talk about what it means to have a healthy, active living strategy and how that should be funded and what are the principles. Write it. We were asked in 1999 by the Minister of Human Resources Development to write a framework for or on early childhood development that was going to be taken to the First Minister's table. And we said, but they haven't even agreed to a framework. And we were told, well, that's the whole point. Write it. Because once it's at the table, they will not talk about whether they want it or not. They'll start editing it. And that seven-page document became the basis for the framework that the country signed in 2000 on early childhood development. So do it. You have a gold mine of literature. And we need help in terms of figuring out what are the salient points, what are the major pieces, what are the organizing principles, and what are the key components, how should they be funded. Um, I really would encourage you to do this. And finally, um, remove barriers. You know, even though we're talking about new agendas and new possibilities and expanding recreation, there are many programs in place and there's still really fundamental barriers to people participating. And we saw a background paper that was written by Howie Dayton on this for this summit, talking about that range of barriers related to transportation, cultural factors, information, childcare. There are a lot of them. But the big one is affordability, and the big one comes in the form of user fees. Now, that's a huge problem. The user fees is the tip of a fiscal iceberg. And what I mean by that is most of the public programs are delivered by municipalities, funded by municipalities, and our municipal governments in Canada have very few levers, and very few sources of revenue at their disposal relative to what they have to do. They depend primarily on property taxes, very regressive tax, but not appropriate for the agenda that we have. They depend on user fees and licenses and parking tickets. So next time you get a parking ticket, don't complain. It's probably paying for your salary or one of your kids' programs. It's coming back to you in some way. It's unfortunately sad, but true. And there's a lot of conversation in the country about how we have to look at those big financing arrangements. The chairman of our board, Alan Broadbent, has written a book called Urban Nation, talking about the disconnect between what cities have to do and, and you know, municipal governments and their sources of revenue. And the mayor of Calgary has a website called Cities Matter, where he discusses this as well. We have a new institute on municipal financing and governance in the country trying to address these issues too. Because what do cities have to do? We talked about you know, attracting the talent and focusing on their infrastructure. We talked about, you know, and that, and that important sort of social infrastructure that I discussed right at the beginning, and the increasingly complex challenges that cities are facing, and their aging infrastructure. And I think John Frittenberg did an interesting paper prior to the conference talking about the $15 billion infrastructure deficit in Canada. And that was an underestimate because it was a narrow definition. We have about $123 billion of an infrastructure deficit in Canada, according to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. We can't fund it through property taxes. Now, some of the good news has been that we've had an infrastructure, recreation infrastructure financing over two years as part of our economic action plan. That will expire in 2011. We had Building Canada, which was from 2007 to 2014. Um, and the good news about that, that was broader infrastructure, it was a, a billion dollars of federal money for urban infrastructure. And the good news about that is that there was a gas tax fund and um, uh, I guess a holiday for municipalities from paying the GST. So that's due to expire in 2014 as well. We still have that fundamental problem. Maybe, Tom, Tom you might be able to address uh, whether the three P's are, are the way to go in your paper, you know, that's something that we have to think about. But I'll tell you where there is money. There's $150 million as of 2010 in that children's fitness tax credit. That was a tax credit introduced in 2007 for children's fitness. And it's announced as $500. 
It is not $500. We wrote a two-page op-ed for anybody interested called When is $500 not $500? It's announced as $500. It is worth 15% of that as every single non-refundable credit. 15% is the lowest marginal tax rate. You multiply that times the amount of the credit, it's $75. And you don't get it. Don't go to your mailbox. It's not in the mail. You reduce your taxes by that amount. So if you're a higher income family, you reduce your top payable tax by $75. If you're a lower income family and you owe very little or nothing, you get nothing. Even though you're the family, that probably needs that the most. And not only that, not only is this highly inequitable, the problem is we're not investing in infrastructure. We're investing in tax treats for higher income families and these little boutique programs. And what we need to be doing is thinking, I think the Alberta Recreation and Parks Association has said this so eloquently in their materials about the recreation infrastructure, which includes the parks and playgrounds and the hiking trails, both the places and the programs. We need to invest in that infrastructure and get that message out that it's not just the individual, enabling individual families to be able to pay for their programs. If we had all the money in the world, that would be nice, but we don't. So we need to think more intelligently and strategically about those tax credits. The children's arts tax credit worth the same $500 was just announced in 2011. Same problem. We're spending billions collectively on those credits that are going to families that probably need it far less than other families. So there is a source of money. In the meantime, until we sort through some of those big problems, I would encourage you to do the following. Take a look at your recreation subsidy policies, your municipal subsidy policies. Please make sure that they're not too exclusionary. In some cases, they are so complex, they require so much material. You know, in some cases, you need to get a doctor's letter to show that you're poor. You need to pay $40 to get your $50 subsidy. And is that how we should be using our health care system? So Vancouver has recently introduced something interesting, their leisure access card for lower income families, for not only welfare recipients, but lower income families as well. There's some good work across the country. We should figure out what that good work is and get it out there. You know, really let people know what are some of the good practices in that regard. I think we can also use our schools more actively, and you know, we've probably talked about this in the past, I know, but maybe your recreation ministers can start talking to your education ministers, because According to Playworks, only 5% of schools are offering the adequate uh, physical education in schools. We're doing a terrible job in that regard, probably one of the worst in the developed world. So why aren't we expanding our physical education program in schools, which would be accessible to everybody and um, you know, would require these people to participate in some way, address a major health problem at the same time as an equity problem. And there are other possibilities as well, like using schools, for example, in Ontario, to have you know, community use of schools, where the government had given $40 million every year to schools so that they wouldn't have to charge uh, fees to groups to use the schools. And now there are 175 schools that are designated as priority schools, where they can't charge any fees to any of the groups. The government effectively pays whatever extra costs are required. So we have a way of using our existing infrastructure far more strategically than we have. So all this to say, there is a big agenda. Some of the policy agendas are really big questions, big constitutional questions. For example, the city's issue that a lot of people are working on. But there are some policy agendas where I think you could play a really vital role. And the country needs you right now in these areas, particularly around health care and the aging population. Please play your, have your mark. But even if you choose not to participate in any of those policy conversations, you can make a fantastic difference in your own communities just by the way you think and help others think about recreation and understand recreation and the way in which you see the opportunities to work more broadly. I really hope that this agenda helps, or that this national summit actually helps put recreation very, very front and center on the public agenda, and ideally at the top of our public agenda. Thank you so much.